Zachary and with the um, Mississippi University for Women are in the BSN program and me and my associate been on the biggest uh, presentation on congestive heart failure. We have Raylan Terry, Kenny Clark, and Lee Downing. At the end of this presentation, we hope a uh, learner will be able to understand the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure with 90% 90, 90 accuracy, recall the common signs and symptoms associated with congestive heart failure with 90% accuracy, recall tests performed to diagnose congestive heart failure, recognize the prognosis associated with congestive heart failure, define and describe congestive heart failure, recognize the risk factors associated with it, determine ethical issues associated with patients, that have congestive heart failure and develop a plan of care with appropriate nursing diagnosis and interventions with 90% accuracy. First, uh, pathophysiology uh, that have abnormalities that may cause congestive heart failure, pressure and volume overload, uh, loss of heart muscle, primary muscle disease, excessive peripheral demand such as high cardiac output. Congestive heart failure uh, have the heart muscle is reduced contractility and um, they're causing a decrease in cardiac output and the heart becomes inadequate to meet peripheral demands of the body. of congestive heart failure is a decrease in muscle contractility, less atrial fluid pressure to increase, causing the pulmonary congestion and shortness of breath, and an increase in systematic valve overload, which can decrease cardiac output. Signs and symptoms to look for during congestive heart failure, the patient will have a cough, they'll get very fatigued, they'll have loss of appetite, uh, nocturia, which is peeing during the night, irregular pulse rate and palpitations from the fluid overload, shortness of breath, it usually occurs on exertion or lying down, uh, ascites, which is fluid in the stomach, edema in ankles and feet primarily, uh, weight gain, distended neck veins, the patient will have wet lung sounds. We also like to know, uh, call those crackles um, when you listen to them. And they'll also be coughing up pink, frothy mucus. To diagnose congestive heart failure, the nurse must attain medical history, review signs and symptoms, and perform a physical exam. Different tests to verify congestive heart failure. First, we'll do blood tests to check organ function. We'll do a pro BNP, CKMB, a CKP, and a troponin. Also, we can do chest X-ray, CT scan, and MRI. During a chest X-ray, CT, or MRI, the heart may appear enlarged, and fluid buildup may be visible in the lungs. Also, we can do an electrocardiogram, also known as ECG. It records the electrical activity of your heart. Uh, the main test, number one test, to confirm diagnosis is an echocardiogram. It distinguishes systolic heart failure from diastolic heart failure. It uses sound waves to produce a video image of the heart, shows the size and shape of the heart, and it can also show the ejection fraction rate, which shows how your heart's pumping. Um, it also shows other problems or evidence of previous myocardial infarction. So any heart damage the heart's had in the past, it will be visible on the echo. Also, the doctor can order a stress test and this just measures how the heart and blood vessels respond on exertion. Or a coronary angiogram, which is just a flexible catheter inserted into a blood vessel 
at the groin or arm and it's guided through the aorta into the coronary artery. This test helps identify narrowed arteries that can be caused of congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure can be controlled. Um, your prognos prognosis increases if you take your medications like you're supposed to, change your lifestyle such as exercise, eat right, no, limit your intake on salty food, treat the underlying cause, and some patients even have to get pacemakers and implantable them on defibrillators to help control arrhythmias. Your prognosis, uh, mortality rates following hospitalization, uh, 30 days increases your chance of mortality. One year, your chance of mortality increases 22%, and five years, 42.3%. So each hospitalization increases your mortality rate by 20 to 22%. Things to make congestive heart failure worse is lack of blood flow to the heart, that's known as angina, uh, eating high salt foods, heart attacks, infections, and other illnesses, and non compliant with medications, and also new and abnormal heart rhythms. So, any of these things can make congestive heart failure worse, so therefore, we should try to control these, have a better lifestyle. <coughs> and recognize the signs and symptoms to be able to recognize congestive heart failure. Okay, I'm Lee Downing and I'm going to talk to you about the definition of congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is a chronic condition in which the heart cannot pump enough blood to meet the body's needs. And this is done because the heart, um, when it pumps, it scars up because of fluid overload, and so it scars up and so it doesn't contract like it should. Um, in some cases, the heart can't fill enough with blood because it's not contracting all the way. In other cases, the heart can't pump blood to the rest of the body, and that's what causes the edema. Some people have both the problems. <clears throat> this develops over time. Again, it's scarring of the heart, and the more it scars, then the less it's gonna be able to pump and the heart's pumping actually grows weaker. It's measured by your ejection fraction, and that is the measurement of the percentage of blood leaving the heart each time it contracts. Normal levels are 50 to 68%, and congestive heart failure is diagnosed with, um, with less than 40%. And what um, Sarah said, that's when they can do a angiogram, which is a heart cath, and they will put it in a catheter, and they shoots the dial, and it shows you exactly how hard and how much that heart is pumping. There are different types of congestive heart failure. There's right-sided right -sided heart failure and left-sided heart failure. Right-sided occurs if the heart is unable to pump enough blood to the lungs to supply adequate oxygenation. Left-sided heart failure is when it cannot pump enough oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body, or they can have both. The incidence of congestive heart failure is about 5.1 million people in the U.S. suffer congestive heart failure. It can occur in children and adults, and this is when aging can weaken the heart muscle. Older people also have had diseases for many years that lead to heart failure, which can be diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure is the leading cause of hospital stays among people on Medicare. Because we talked about it develops over time. African Americans have the most um, incidence of it. They're more likely to have symptoms at a younger age and have more hospital visits due to heart failure and die from heart failure. Most common is 65 years or older, and then men have a higher rate of heart failure than women. Risk factors and causes. Coronary heart disease is a cause, and coronary heart disease is when the plaque narrows the arteries and reduces blood flow to the heart muscle. 
and when the blood flow weakens to the heart, it causes scarring. It can be caused by hypertension, and that causes pressures to rise, and when the pressures rise and they stay over a period of time, it weakens your heart and leads to plaque buildup. Diabetes, over time, high blood sugar levels can damage and weaken the heart muscle and the blood vessels around the heart, leading to heart failure. And other causes of congestive heart failure <coughs> is cardiac. Cardiomyopathy, heart valve disease, arrhythmias, and congenital heart defects. I'm Raylan Terry, and I want to go over some ethical issues and impact that CHF has on caregivers and the patient's life. Um, CHF, defensive management is the obligation of all healthcare professionals. This includes the physicians and the teams of nursing working together to go over the care of the CHF patient. Advanced care planning this starts at hospitalization or diagnosis of the patient with CHF. Um, not doing proper advanced care planning delays the important conversations between the physician and the patient and this also deprives the family of the opportunity to plan for and cope with the life short in nature of CHF. Um, a lot of times patients have to make decisions regarding device placement. This can prolong CHF and also um, End of life care, um, patients often have to decide if they want to consider hospice or palliative care with their CHF diagnosis. CHF, the impact of the patient caregiving has a potential a negative effect on lives. A lot of family members have had experience taking care of patients but when you have to bring mama home or daddy home with CHF or other things and you're the prior priority with taking care of them, it has a potential negative effect. Um, many caregivers, however, feel positive about their role and being able to take care of a loved one. Um, the needs of the family members must be assessed and the initial assessment needs to start at the beginning of the illness. Clinicians should provide extra support immediately, immediately after hospitalization. This can include um, in-home services like home health or hospice. It's a very important transition for the patient and caregivers are more likely to feel burdened whenever they first come home or first realize that they're going to have to take care of a patient or a family member or loved one that has the disease such as CHF. Um, Intervention should be aimed at increasing sense of control and support. It's very important for the patient to not feel like they're losing their independence. Treatment for CHF is typically covered under the individual's insurance, Medicare, Social Security benefits, and disability benefits or some of the plans of insurance that cover CHF. Um, but however, for Social Security benefits, for the patient to qualify, they have to be diagnosed with severe continuing heart failure despite being placed on heart medication. Support groups for CHF. Now, there are many online support groups. Believe it or not, Facebook has many support groups for patients with CHF. Um, another support group is ND Junction and their CHF online support group. Um, other support systems, Home Health, they come out and offer educational social work services and that really helps with patients. Um, Hospital-based heart failure programs, there's many outpatient services that the patient and their caregiver can go to for support. Case management, they help collaborate with other team members to make sure that the patient is getting everything that they need to help with their diagnosis 
and that goes along with the social work services and resources. There's also other things that the patient can do for themselves to help their diagnosis and see to <clears throat> just to name a few things. The patient should reach out and maintain relationships with friends and family. Um, just they shouldn't think that they don't have or are not able to go out to places and enjoy things such as church or other activities that they did prior to their diagnosis. Um, stay active, doing something physical every day, like walking around the house or the yard, helps get their mind off their diagnosis, and encourage encouragement from loved ones to talk to their doctor if they think that he or she may be depressed. A lot of people don't like to admit that they are depressed or don't like to think that they need medication, but sometimes they need that encouragement. Um, and depressed caregivers also have a higher risk of wanting to back out of caregiving or decide that they just can't do it and that really needs to be assessed by the healthcare team. Okay, I'm Penny Clark and I'm going to talk about the fun part of care. How many of you have ever done airplane compression? We do this until I thought I was going to do it. And I really and truly do not think there was any kind of reason or kind of complaint about it but really and truly whenever we start talking about nursing diagnosis it, it does actually create a plan of care that helps us to be able to help the patient and the family the ones that we chose for this presentation of course have decreased cardiac output you can all kind of figure out from what they've all told you before um, the excess fluid volume anytime you have heart failure then typically you have a higher sodium diet you know, that's just something that kind of happens down in the South, especially. With high sodium, you've got high fluid. So uh, the next thing is going to be ineffective tissue perfusion. With the heart not pumping like it's supposed to, it's not providing that perfusion that it needs to the other parts of the body. And then, of course, the impaired gas exchange. That goes along with your CO2 and your oxygen rates. And then the activity intolerance. They're not going to be able to get up and go ride a bicycle like they have in the past. <coughs> But we're going to talk about all these and kind of go into what we can do as nurses and to try to help our patients out. Um, this was kind of went from memory, so you'll have to excuse it because it's been a few years since I've been in nursing school. The etiology of the decreased cardiac output is going to be the heart actually fails to pump enough blood to meet the needs of the body. Um, the blood flow that supplies the heart is also decreased, therefore decreasing cardiac output occurs this causes the insufficient blood and insufficient circulation to the other parts of the body. I have seen before that patients will have like a ruddy color with edema. Um, it's going to be kind of like that maroonish, purplish kind of color that's in their extremities. This is going to be due to the decreased cardiac output. What we're going to be looking for on our subjective and objective data is going to be weakness, shortness of breath, the slow heart rate, discoloration to the extremities, the cool extremities and then the decreased or weak pulses. Interventions, of course, we're always going to assess their level of consciousness just to kind of make sure they haven't had any acute mental status changes. Uh, you're going to monitor their oxygen levels and, of course, uh, the vital signs. That's the reason why they call them vital. And you're going to always listen to the heart and lung sounds. You're going to mo monitor the arterial blood, blood gases. This is what's going to call, tell us on whether or not they need to be on some type of bypass machine. And then we're also going to monitor the electrolytes and we're going to correct that with fluids if at all possible. We always look at short term and long term goals. Our short, short term goal is that patient will begin to exhibit the signs of decreasing shortness of breath within 24 hours. The patient will have decreasing discoloration, which means that that tissue is actually starting to perfuse again and then the patient will receive an adequate amount of rest within 24 hours. A lot of times, you know, the patients with CHL, we find that they will get out and they'll try to do more than what they really should, and when they're doing that, a lot of times they just need a little rest. Um, we're also going to display signs of adequate electrolyte balances within 24 hours. We can also, for our long-term goals, the patient's going to exhibit signs of adequate circulation within 14 days, and then we may try to look at physical therapy with possible rehab placement over the next 30 days. Now the excess fluid volume, this is where sodium and water absorption is enhanced after, and this results in plasma volumes to expand and preload to increase. Um, 
our data that we're going to be looking for is going to be weakness, shortness of breath, the bounding pulse, the edema, difficulty breathing, and then the rails, ronchi, crackle to the lungs upon the auscultation, and then anxiety. You're going to see that where somebody can't breathe, and they're going to be having that, I can't breathe, this is serious type of thing. Um, you're going to look at their LOC again, and you're going to monitor oxygen and vital signs as usual. And again, we're going to get the arterial blood gases. Listen to the heart and lung sounds. Strictly monitor the I and O. We're going to need to know that whatever they're putting in is actually coming out through the kidneys. And we're going to be marking that and making sure that that's what they're doing. You're going to monitor for changes of sputum production. If it starts turning thicker, if it starts getting green, yellow, frothy color, then, you know, we need to kind of be looking at something else to do. We're going to initiate an 1800 milligram sodium diet with 1500 milliliter fluid restriction. If anybody has ever tried to measure that out, it's one and a half liter of fluid that they can have a day. People that have congestive heart failure, we want to keep them just on this side of dehydration. And that's kind of a fine line that you've got to draw. One package of uh, turkey pot pie has got 940 milligrams of sodium. <coughs> These patients are usually used to eating something that's very quick that they can throw in the microwave or oven because they don't have the energy to cook. Your Meals on Wheels program are wonderful programs, however, those are chock full of sodium. The higher amount of sodium that you get in your diet, the more thirsty you're going to be. Uh, we are probably going to be trying to give them 40 milligrams of Lasix IV fluids every 12 hours. Just try to get some of that off. If the Lasix fails, we can look at doing other alternatives like the uh, Demodex. That's kind of a newer thing that we can try also. Um, and then we're going to place a Foley catheter. A lot of times when we place that Foley catheter, we can get in a more accurate amount of the output to make sure that they're doing it. Then our short-term goals and our long-term goals are kind of similar to what we've been dealing with all along. We're going to try to exhibit signs of decreasing shortness of breath. Uh, we want to get that fluid off of them. You know, the more fluid that we can get off of them, the better they can breathe. Then the patient will have a decrease in edema to extremities. They are going to receive an adequate amount of rest, once again. And the patient's going to have an adequate understanding of diet and sodium restrictions within 24 hours. That's the hard one. A lot of times it takes a little bit longer than 24 hours for them to actually understand on their diet. Uh, the long term is they're going to exhibit signs of adequate circulation. They are going to receive possible physical therapy and possible rehab once again. And they're going to understand the importance of daily weights or abdominal measurements to monitor the fluid restriction, the fluid fluctuations. And they're going to know the signs and symptoms of fluid overload and when to call the nurse. Then we're looking at ineffective tissue perfusion. This is a decreased amount of blood pumped from the heart secondary to a decreased preload and stroke volume. This is resulting in an inadequate perfusion. Our data that we're going to be looking for is going to be weakness, chest pain, abnormal pulse, and edema. The interventions we're going to assess for pain and location. You're going to want to know what kind of pain it is, if it feels like a crushing pain. Um, you're also going to administer a beta blocker that's going to be more than likely going to be prescribed by the doctor. You're going to monitor vital signs, monitor blood pressure and pulse, the oxygen saturation, and then the cardiac markers, something that Sarah talked about at the beginning. The patient's not going to have any signs and symptoms of chest pain within 48 hours. We are going to try to have a decrease in edema within 24 hours, and the patient's going to receive, again, an adequate amount of rest. Believe it or not, the rest can actually help the patients that are having a fluctuation of the tissue perfusion. Uh, they're also going to have an understanding of the disease process. Once you can understand how it works, mm -hmm. then we can understand how to fix it. Sometimes you got to get down to basics and you got to kind of explain on how things actually work in the body in order for a patient to kind of get it. Um, they're going to exhibit the signs and symptoms of adequate circulation within 14 days. They, again, possible PT, OT, and then rehab placement. And then they're going to understand and they're going to verbalize when they need to seek that emergent treatment. Now, impaired gas exchange. This is going to be difficulty with oxygen diffusion secondary to, de to exchange of decreased oxygenation and carbon dioxide gases are hindered due to accumulation of secretions. 
Our data that we're looking for is going to be shortness of breath. It's going to be the rail when you're listening to the lungs. It's going to be a productive cough and fatigue. They're going to be working overtime to actually breathe. So this is what's going to cause a lot of the fatigue that's going to be coming in. You're going to look for the skin color for potential cyanosis. Cyanosis is not always around the lips like we were kind of thinking in nursing school. Cyanosis can kind of occur anywhere. It could occur in the tips of the fingers. Um, they're going to have a decrease in their adventitious lung sounds within 72 hours. They're going to receive an adequate amount of rest and their cough is going to decrease within 48 hours. They're also going to demonstrate uh, controlled cough. Controlled cough actually helps to decrease the circulation, I mean, to get the secretions out, which will, and, and I tell my patients all the time, if you're watching TV, do it every time a commercial comes on. That's four times an hour. Um, they're going to exhibit signs of adequate gas exchange within 14 days, and the patient will receive long-term PT with possible rehab. And then they're going to understand when to seek that emergent treatment. And then we're also going to understand the controlled cough as part of, that's part of their every, that's going to be part of their everyday life now. Now activity intolerance. This is where blood is just diverted away from the less crucial areas, including extremities to supply adequate oxygenation slash blood flow to the brain. What that basically means is they're getting weaker. This is going to be weakness in extremities, limited range of motion, depression, and fatigue. We're going to teach energy conservation. We're going to teach on proper safety measures. We're also going to consult OT and PT, and we're going to promote rest. They need to learn how to conserve their energy. You, you want to conserve your energy for the things that you need to do every day. Um, the patient's going to have zero falls. They're going to demonstrate an adequate knowledge of energy conservation, and then they're going to receive an adequate amount of rest also. They're going to understand safety measures. We want to try to keep them safe. And then patients going to exhibit an understanding of long-term safety measures within 30 days, and then they're going to receive the PT and OT with possible rehab placement. Again, that's just about on all of them. And then they're going to have an adequate knowledge of fall prevention within the next 30 days. And then the patient's going to have an adequate knowledge of energy conservation measures within the next 30 days. Now, that's a lot of information that we've given y'all. Do y'all have any questions at this time or anything like that? All right. These are just a list of references that y'all can use. That if you want to, um, Lee or I one can get them to you. These a lot of these we found, but there are really some good references for you that if you do need any type of congestive heart failure teaching or anything like that. And we thank you so much for your time.